Welcome to the Green Team Speaks To, the podcast for the Paulson Institute's Green Finance Center. Hi, I'm Felicia Wu, Associate Director of the Green Finance Center at the Paulson Institute. Today, we'll be speaking with Johannes Erpelainen, Professor of Energy, Resources, and Environment at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He is also the founding director of the Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy, an interdisciplinary research program hosted by the school that designs, tests, and implements better energy policies in emerging economies. Guys, welcome to Green Team Speaks to podcast. Um, wonderful to have the opportunity to chat with you today. You're a leading energy ex- policy expert and very a very knowledgeable scholar in the field. I very much look forward to our conversation today. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to, to do this. I look forward to the discussion. Great. Um, okay, so it won't be a podcast during this time without talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. So if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll kind of jump, uh, start the questions there, and then we'll then I'll turn to ask you about your recent report um, called Belt and Road Decision Making in China and Recipient Countries, How and to What Extent Does sustain- Sustainability Matter? Sounds great. Good. Okay. So the question, uh, the pandemic has without a doubt wrecked havoc on this uh, status quo here. It has caused a severe ongoing global recession, which compels governments to really think long and hard, innovatively and creatively about the economic recovery after it. So what actions should governments take to seize the moment and ensure that the economic recovery is green and sustainable? That's a great question. And the first thing I would say is that I I do think a green stimulus program funded by governments is a necessary step at this stage. And that's for a number of reasons. One of them is that we have really seen a collapse in private investment in some of these key sectors like energy. And at the same time, the interest rates are at an exceptionally low level. So there is a great opportunity right now to get some really nice returns on investment through public spending. And if we look at how to do it and what to focus on, I think the key areas of focus should really be somehow related to innovation and in particular clean technology innovation. The goal here should really be to reduce the cost of sustainable, low-carbon technologies. These could be new forms of energy. These could be battery storage. We could be talking about electric vehicles. We could be talking about transportation infrastructure. And the reason why this is so important is that what we want to see is a kind of market transformation where some of these leading countries make investments, costs degrees, and then other governments and firms start making the same investments. And ideally, we would be able to repeat the success of renewable energy, which really became competitive thanks to huge investments made by countries like Denmark, Germany, and China. Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, to narrow the scope a little bit for this and tying it to the Belt and Road, which is the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the focus of your recent paper, uh, which for for listeners will link to the recording. Um, how does the the pandemic impact the dynamics between China and the recipient countries on the BRI, and what are the implications for greening the Belt and Road in the short term? Uh, for example, the the recovery, and in the long term, um, thinking how the recovery feeds into longer term strategies for these countries. I think we already see some pretty significant changes. Before the COVID-19, the Belt and Road Initiative was China's big effort to create connectivity between China and some of these other countries along the Belt and Road. Think of countries like Pakistan or Kenya, for example. And what's happened now is that these countries have moved from a kind of long-term planning and growth mode into dealing with a public health crisis 
and trying to reinvigorate their struggling national economies. What this means for China is that there is a danger that these recipient countries might not be able to pay. A lot of this finance coming from China is pretty affordable. It offers a competitive interest rate for the recipients, but it's still money that the recipients need to pay back. And with these recent economic difficulties, many of these Belt and Road projects are stalling. And that's a big risk for China. On the one hand, it might actually hurt China's own economic recovery. So if we are looking at this whole idea of Belt and Road, it was really to generate revenue for Chinese companies and to relieve industrial overcapacity in China. If those payments are not made, then these companies are going to face some serious economic difficulties and they might require yet another round of government subsidies to survive uh, in China itself. And so these payments are important. On the other hand, if China is too insistent on those payments, if it takes a very aggressive and combative approach here, it could carry political costs. We have already seen a lot of criticism of the Belt and Road about things like a Chinese debt trap or other criticisms of dependence on China. And if China begins to play hardball with the recipients, then China's reputation as a kind of friendly, neutral power is going to suffer. So China is really between the frying pan and the fire, uh, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we've already seen this in some countries. So, for example, Pakistan has asked China if they could get some uh, additional time to pay back. We have seen in Thailand and Malaysia that some very important railway projects are now on hold because of payment difficulties. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yes, jumping into the report a little bit more, and and I should say, I think if you want to take um, a chance here to to give a quick uh, line or two overview about the report, I think it'd be very beneficial for listeners here. Um, but, uh, you know, to add on to that, um, the report finds that there are very few actors in China or in these recipient countries who advocate for environmental policies and priorities during these, during the project development phase. Um, and so uh, after your overview, would you um, be able to tell us a little bit more about the process of how the projects are developed for the Belt and Road and why it lends to a a lack of environmental considerations. Absolutely. To start with an overview of the report, which is available on our website, size-icep.org, where you can download it for free. What we tried to do in the report was to understand to what extent and how do these sustainability considerations play a role in Chinese decision-making and interactions with these host countries. So the Belt and Road Initiative is a finance initiative where Chinese companies go abroad and they secure finance from Chinese banks to build infrastructure. And so what we wanted to understand was things like who are the key actors in China and in the recipient countries making the decisions? What are the processes that lead to these decisions? And how do these different actors interact with each other? And of course, then, to what extent do sustainability considerations inform decision makings about projects, finance, implementation, and so on. And we did this study by looking at China and five different recipient countries, Malaysia, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Kenya, and Indonesia. Now, to answer your question about this issue of environmental priorities, we did find that they don't play much of a role in the Belt and Road decision-making. They were rarely present, and if they were, they were typically secondary to economic or, in some cases, geopolitical considerations. I think the main reason for this is that most Belt and Road projects really follow this bottom-up process. They don't come from top-down. They are not carefully managed by top leaders in China. Instead, they are promoted by project developers like Chinese construction companies that are trying to make money, basically. These companies try to secure local permits and 
clients for their projects in the host countries like Pakistan, and they're trying to secure financing from Chinese policy banks. These processes are driven by profit motivation, really, and environmental considerations are only there to the extent that there is some special concern by either the host country or Chinese regulators. So the process is a lot less strategic and structured than many people think. The Belt and Road is really not a master plan. It's really more a collection of bottom-up processes that have just been labeled or branded Belt and Road. And unless you see some strong commitment from the host country, it is not entirely clear in most of these cases the Chinese authorities have a very strong interest, for example, in sustainability in Pakistan or Kenya. Mm-hmm. Yet there have been um, Chinese, um, I'd say, uh, so, some vocal voices about a greeting a BRI from Chinese authorities, um, especially uh, President Xi at the Belt and Road Forum in 2019, correct? Um, and so it, it just seems to me that there, to, in order to green the Belt and Road, there uh, will require, I guess, to, to your point, support from you know top political leadership in in that sort of top down um, format. Um, but you know, as they are often preoccupied with other, like you mentioned, political, geopolitical, and economic priorities. Um, it, it seems like we will need a, st- a strong coalition of actors to kickstart some concrete measures to, in kind of a sustainability direction. Um, and who do you see as the key actors here? Could you highlight some of uh, the policy suggestions that you have um, in in the report um, for the short and for the long term as well? So what we try to do is we try to formulate our policy recommendations around a list of three C's, and those three C's are capacity, coordination, and control. So I agree 100% with the idea that there needs to be some stronger leadership and there needs to be a powerful coalition to effect this change. And this requires going through all three. So on the capacity side, I do think today Chinese banks, companies, and regulators all still need to make some additional effort to manage environmental and sustainability risks. They have not been very effective in doing this, and they haven't faced the pressure yet from host countries or multilateral agencies. So it seems to me that this kind of capacity building is the first step. The second important step is coordination, and this is where this coalition is really going to be important. To us, it seems that China's Ministry of Environment and Ecology which has created this Belt and Road International Green Development Coordination Initiative, uh, has some potential. So if this ministry took the lead and invited some of the other key ministries, banks, companies, and importantly, representatives from the host countries like Pakistan to come together and develop strategies, that could help a lot because you would have all the different major players in the same place. And we also advocate or support the idea that China should have country-specific task forces that would look at these issues in specific countries because they can be very different depending on the country's natural resources, economy, political relations with China, and so on. And finally, and this is maybe the most challenging part, on the control front, We think that the initiative here really needs to come from the Ministry of Environment and Ecology. And one way that they could try to achieve this goal is to go about doing environmental impact assessment in a way that always insists at least on the Chinese standards. So if any country has a weaker standard than would be applied to a domestic Chinese project, then the MEE should insist that the project developer go through that same standard. So this would achieve coordination, harmonization, and it would protect these companies from risks abroad. And to make this happen, we would support and suggest inspections of projects with fines 
and punishment for uh, violations of the rules uh, applied in the environmental impact assessment. Mm -hmm. I will, I want to pick apart one specific, um, I guess, actor that you have mentioned several times in the answer, which is the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. Um, it's uh, maybe not a little known fact, but I think the MEE itself is sort of hamstrung by the uh, bureaucracy of uh, regulators in China. Um, I, by that saying, you know, kind of there's there's a uh, there's an order, pecking order of um, agencies and departments that have uh, a little bit more political power than others. Um, you know, kind of the ones that are leading um, are, you know, the NDRC, the state council versus, um, you know, the very, those are the more powerful ones in, in a sense. Um, and so uh, is there enough muster that ME could pull? Um, and, and maybe maybe it's sort of a shared, um, there's a short, shared structure or, you know, just kind of how would you see that those dy political dynamics work? I think that's a very important point that you're making there. And in fact, if you look at MEE and this Belt and Road Initiative projects today, MEE doesn't really have much of a role. It doesn't have the ability to approve. So I would imagine that to make this happen, there would have to be a fairly strong push uh, from some of these more powerful players in the Chinese political system to elevate MEE to a more significant role. To us, it definitely seems like it would be the right organization based on capabilities and expertise, but it would need to somehow lift, kind of uplift its political um, position and strengthen its role uh, to make this happen. And that would have to be a political decision. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I'm, I'm seeing that there should be a kind of involvement of other um, kind of regulators as well in the financial realm um, as you've defined the BRI as a more financial initiative, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So so we should see the PBOC, the CSRC, all of, all of those regulators involved as well. Absolutely. This is really one of those challenges that we often face in trying to kind of mainstream environmental standards is that we really need to have multiple players and you need to somehow make sure that they all kind of embrace these greener standards. And so yeah. ME cannot do this alone. It needs to do it working with some of these others that then make in the end the financial decisions. Yeah. They just how do you how do you have them talk to each other, right? <laughs> that that is a major challenge. And and again, I really don't see any other way for this except for some real leadership from the top where basically some of these very high-level political leaders basically tell the ministries that they need to uh, come together and do this. Um, yeah, uh, just to move on, I think the, um, the report mentions in, in kind of the end uh, recommendations and, and part the green investment principles, um, which uh, the, the Paulson Institute has been engaged with from the beginning and now serves on the steering committee for for it. Um, it's mentioned as a good try, but not good enough. Uh, we'll take that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's our hope that while voluntary, though, that the principles are more than just confidence building measures, um, especially as we see more signatories come on board. Um, and so I think selfishly, I'd want to ask here, um, do you have any suggestions for the principles as we enter year two for more tangible implementation of, um, of those principles? Yes. So first of all, I would definitely agree that the green investment principles have been a very important uh, move forward because they've created this common framework that many different actors apply and they've made you know, discussing and addressing these issues a lot easier. So in that sense, I, I think it's a, it's a very commendable initiative. The Thank challenge is, is really that they're voluntary. So what it means is that you have this challenge where the people who have the least to lose from standards are the most likely to embrace and follow them, whereas the worst polluters or emitters or violators 
would be the ones who are less likely to commit to them and, and follow them. So it seems to me that the green investment principles provide the framework. And if we want to move this forward, then there needs to be some government initiative to start kind of turning them from voluntary into at least partially mandatory efforts, where I could envision a scenario where the Chinese government recognizes environmental and social risks as critical to protecting China's interests and reputation abroad. And then based on this recognition, the government could take some of these green investment principles and begin turning them into rules and regulations. And if that were to happen, then that would have a very significant positive effect on the sustainability of these finance initiatives. And I do think in the COVID-19 situation where it has become so important for China to protect its reputation, this is more likely perhaps than in the past. Hmm. Okay, well, um, good. We'll, we'll take that into consideration then. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think uh, stepping away from the coronavirus and the report uh, a bit, I, um, as a leader uh, in this field, I just want to get your insights on um, some of China's latest moves in this space in the recent months. Um, we've seen announcements on a plan to focus on new infrastructure, a new draft energy law that prioritizes renewables, favorable news for strengthening the coal industry, but also the exclusion of fossil fuels from a new green bronze project catalog draft. Um, so with all of these developments, um, what do you have any um, thoughts on them? Um, are there implications of these policies? Should they be put into practice as some of them are in draft form? Um, kind of what what's in, in your crystal ball looking forward? Absolutely. To start, I, I do think the new infrastructure initiative is relevant because it does include a number of relevant components. These would include transmission infrastructure, which is very important for renewables. It includes investments in electric vehicles. There is also a plan to invest in intercity railway systems. So when we put all these things together, I think overall that's a, an important step and it fits well, again, into this idea that we need to somehow kind of reinvigorate and stimulate the economy. And, and this kind of stimulus strategy seems pretty reasonable to me. The draft energy law, is useful because it tries to bring together this somewhat fragmented legislation in China before, and it does prioritize renewables. It gives them this uh, sort of additional push. But what I've seen and kind of going through some of the reviews and commentary on this, the implementation at this point is still a little uncertain. We haven't seen yet very concrete details or implementation guide, guidelines, and this is always so important in China as well as almost any other emerging country. But the, often the, the real action is in implementation less than uh, what, what's put on paper. So we'll have to see how this, this goes. I think the big challenge we face in China is that there is at the same time, the coal lobby is very active. So China's coal industry got kind of a boost and an, and an argument from COVID-19 because it created this interest in self-reliance and China does still have some pretty significant uh, coal reserves to burn. So they've made the energy security argument. And right now there's some concern that the next five-year plan might have yet another batch of coal-fired power plants motivated by economic stimulus in construction, as well as energy security, and then possibly with quite relaxed permitting process which could result then in this unfortunate outcome where, in the best case, China spends a lot of money building things that it doesn't need because there's already significant overcapacity. And in the worst case, it actually adds yet another kind of round of carbon polluting power plants to the system. Finally, on the green bonds, of course, I was happy to see that fossil fuels would not be included. That seems like a pretty reasonable and 
in some sense, progressive move. So overall, I think there's a lot of good, but we really need to see what happens with coal because China's been struggling with this move away from coal now for almost 10 years, and it still remains quite uncertain in many ways. Uh, absolutely. Definitely agree with you there. Um, and it's uh, the COVID-19 situation is definitely um, kind of bringing coal back up to the top of minds and agendas there. Um, so lastly, just a, a fun one to close here. Um, what are some of the ways that you live a green lifestyle? I know that you bike a lot, uh, but there are there other um, things in your in your life that that really contribute to sustainable development? There's a few things that I, I try to do in my, my daily life. The first one is that I mostly eat vegetarian food. I almost never buy meat. I may sometimes eat a little bit of fish on a special day, but almost all of my food is low-carbon uh, vegetarian food. My electricity is 100% renewable. I subscribe to a program that generates green low-carbon credits for my electricity. And like you said, I have my bike. I don't actually even have a driver's license. So that's another way I try to be sustainable. I do want to highlight here that I'm a big believer in systemic change. So the most important thing I do for sustainability is talk about it, teach it, give donations to environmental groups, and try to promote you know, more systemic change. Mm -hmm. Very good to hear. Um, I, while I agree the systemic change is important, I think every individual does have their own role to play and I greatly appreciate um, kind of the actions that you've taken um, and also appreciate your time here today and um, sharing your insights with us on, on this very timely topic. Um, and, and actually we, we don't have much time. <laughs> it, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed now and, and hopefully as come, as we mentioned, as countries start to think about the recovery. That's right. And uh, thanks so much for having me. I do hope that we can move from this COVID-19 situation back to what seemed to be a kind of promising increase in awareness about climate change. We all need to work with this together. We need to make personal changes. We need to lead by example. We need to advocate for systemic change and we don't have a lot of time. So there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I appreciate all the work that uh, you all are doing uh, at the Paulson Institute uh, on this front. Uh, same, uh, same at SAIS. Uh, thank you so much again. Thanks for having me.